Well, I believe it's 8.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, and welcome to the National Press Club. Bright and early this morning. I know our president, John Hughes of Bloomberg, had hoped to be here this morning, but he has a pressing personal matter and had to interrupt those plans, so our thoughts are with him this morning. And before we get started, I know as a journalist myself, uh, I'm Mark Hamrick, Washington Bureau Chief with Bankrate.com, and I was 2011 president of the club. I'm pleased to fill in this morning. As we transition to this subject this morning, I think it's important that we all uh, at least continue our thoughts and prayers for the victims in South Carolina, which is a religious-related uh, topic uh, as well, and uh, it would be inappropriate to talk about this subject without referencing that uh, tragedy, which is so sad, uh, the news of the morning. Uh, the club-sponsored news conference, the Newsmaker format this morning, is part of our uh, ongoing effort to uh, present uh, programs of relevance for the journalism community and abroad. This event is open to National Press Club members and credentialed members of the news media. As many of you know, the club is the world's leading organization for journalists. You can lear learn more about the club at our website, press.org. I'd like to thank Eric Kaplan, president of Kaplan Communications, a member of the Newsmakers Committee for organizing this morning's event, and our own executive director, Bill McCarran. Well, as you know, earlier this morning, at the Vatican, Pope Francis delivered his encyclical on the environment, depending on the font, I'm told, 184 pages or fewer, and it is translated to English at the Vatican website. And we're going to hear the official U.S. Catholic response to the Pope's prescriptive guidance involving the future of our home, planet Earth. We'd like to welcome our guests this morning, and I will introduce uh, both as we move along. Uh, we want to welcome our guest, Archbishop Joseph Kurtz, President of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and Archbishop of Louisville, Kentucky, Your Excellency, and Cardinal Donald Wuerl, who many of Washingtonians know, the Archbishop of Washington, Your Eminence, good to have you both here this morning. Both will have prepared remarks, and afterward I will call on members of the audience for questions. When I do that, I will ask kindly, perhaps firmly, that you identify yourself by name and the outlet you're representing, or if you're a National Press Club member. We have slotted up to an hour for our program this morning, depending on how many questions you all have, and I understand uh, Archbishop Kurtz uh, may remain around for some questions and interviews uh, around the building afterwards. So to begin, um, we'll ask uh, the Archbishop to make his remarks, and I will slide down to the end of the table. Mark, thank you so very much, and good morning, everyone. I, I want to join with uh, what Mark said. Uh, our hearts go out to the, the terrible tragedy that occurred in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, to the families and all those uh, who are affected. Uh, it is a joy for me to be with all of you today, and, and I have to begin by saying yesterday, uh, Pope Francis asked that the encyclical be received with an open heart. And so it's with an open heart and with deep gratitude that I, and I must say, along with all the brother bishops of uh, the United States, we welcome this new encyclical, uh, Laudati Si. Uh, Mark is right that some versions are 180 pages. Mine was 110, and I guess uh, it was because the print was a little smaller. So, uh, but uh, a, a great, great gift. Uh, those of you who've had a chance already to begin to read it know that it's really a very beautiful and it's a very extensive treatment of what Pope Francis has called our common home. He talks about the fact that all people are considered a, in a deep and intertwined relationship, first of all with God, who is our creator, with all of our brothers and sisters, and then with the great gift, the gift that our creator has provided in all of creation for, for proper stewardship. He speaks in the pastoral letter rightly about uh, the teachings of his predecessors, and so he joins a, a great body of teaching. Uh, the Pope over and over again in the encyclical says that care for the things of this earth is necessarily bound with care for one another, and especially those who are poor. He calls it an interdependency. This interdependency extends from a deep respect due to every human person, to all living beings, and to the earth which we call our home. 
the words that he used, uh, it's perhaps somewhat new, is integral ecology. It's an ecology or a study of our home that draws attention to the rich treasury of thought that people of faith can bring with them to conversations about the human person and also about our environment. Uh, I love one quote, it's, if, you're, if you're checking it, it's, it's uh, quote number 229, so this is not a small encyclical. Uh, he says, we must regain the conviction that we need one another, that we have a shared responsibility for others and the world, and then, and I love this part, and that being good and decent are worth it. Being good and decent are worth it. Our Holy Father invites us to reflect on all the points of human activity, and he speaks on very, very uh, individual choices as well as the public square. He speaks constantly, appropriately, about urgent action that clearly needs to guide us, and he says that, quote, he's painfully aware of what's happening to our world and that we need to grow in solidarity, responsibility, and compassionate care. Over and over again, he talks about the earth as a gift, and a gift from our creator, and asks us in strong terms to avoid a culture of uh, acquiring things, of simply looking at ourselves as individuals and as exploiting. And he uses a phrase he's used very often, the throw-away culture, to reject a throw-away culture. Our Holy Father uh, repeatedly speaks about the urgent need for honest dialogue, especially about the environment. He, he talks about very specific things, about uh, slums in which people are forced to live, on the lack of clean water, about a consumerism mentality. And then perhaps this is the center of his message in some ways. It's a, a small question. What kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us? What kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us? I'd like to make just a few small observations before I conclude, and that is, first of all, the, our Pope is speaking with a very much a pastor's voice and with a deep respect for the role of science. He also, I think, brings, although he doesn't use this word, when I was in theology, we were told that whenever something of very great importance, especially a matter of life, is involved, we should have tutsierism. That's a Latin word. It means just take the safer course. Always choose the safer course when you're dealing with something of grave matter. And I don't think that phrase is there, but the principle is throughout. And then I'd like to say a word about what I think are three essential areas that our Catholic community is being called to be involved in. First of all, to advocate. To advocate on a global level, on a national level, and on local levels. To advocate uh, for the common good, for uh, those who are without a voice and who are very vulnerable, the poor. Um, we know that, that faith, if done well, re actually enriches public life. And we know also that technology, as he says, can tell us what we can do, but we do need voices, moral voices, to tell us what we ought to do. I also want to say that the church, besides advocacy, uh, needs to continue to take seriously our role in formation, formation of young people and formation of adults, formation of ourselves. Uh, this formation in integral uh, ecology means that we need to consistently talk about care for the voiceless and the vulnerable from the moment of conception to natural death to the poorest of people and also at the same time to great care of the earth, in a sense to cultivate what we would call religious virtues, religious virtues that uh, show themselves in civic responsibility. And then finally, uh, the use of our resources in the way we, quite frankly, build buildings, build churches, the way we, we seek ways to do things in a way that honor the earth. So our Holy Father calls for genuine and true dialogue. It will require sacrifice and confronting of what we might call good faith disagreements. 
but he ends with great, great hope. He says, we should be encouraged that at, that at the heart of this world, the Lord of life who loves us the most is always present. He does not abandon us. And so uh, we not only receive this message with joy, but we seek to be responsible in caring for our common home, a home that God has entrusted to us. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And uh, next, we'll ask uh, His Eminence, Cardinal Wuerl, to come to the podium. Thank you, Mark. And I would also like to join with Archbishop Kurtz and Mark in offering our prayerful remembrance and our solidarity with those who are so aggrieved in Charleston. And uh, just a reminder that we need to hold in our hearts uh, all of the families of those who died. When, when we received the material for this encyclical, accompanying the embargoed copy of the encyclical was a handwritten note from Pope Francis. And it was typical. It was typical of his pastoral style. The message was short but warm in its reference to our bonds of, and remember this was written now to his brother bishops, our bonds of unity, charity, and peace, and a request for prayers for himself. But in this brief note, he, he focuses the letter. He says, it's on the care of our common home. And for me, this sums up the substance of the encyclical, although it does take many, many pages to say that. Uh, as I read Laudato Si, what first came to mind was the magnificence of God's creation and how, how it's destined to be shared by everyone. It doesn't belong to anyone. It's meant for all of us and every generation. And this is the high point of the, of the letter. It's meant for generations yet to come. It's clear that we have to care for it in order that it not be exploited or debased so that it will be there. It will be there for children, grandchildren, in my case, grandnephews, grandnieces, as we go into the future. It's in this light that the Pope sees what he calls the urgent challenge to protect our common home. And this includes a concern to bring the whole human family together in a conversation, in an effort to seek a sustainable and integral development. Clearly, as a pastor, as a teacher, the Pope underlines that he is speaking out of a long-standing church tradition. He's applying the faith to current <coughs> issues today, to the circumstances of our day. The encyclical is, as I read it, a way of reading the signs of the times. It's an invitation as well, and he makes this very clear. It's an invitation to everyone to join him in this conversation about how do we, how do we ensure that the good earth remains the good earth for generations to come. We need a conversation, he says, which includes, and this is a quote, everyone, since the environmental challenge we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect all of us. I find that the Pope's decision to start with empirical data, that first chapter begins with Conclusions based on science. I think it shows his and the church's deep respect for the world of science and the understanding that it is a domain of its own. And so he begins with what is, is evident data. It saves the encyclical from being dismissed as simply abstract reflection. The encyclical does reflect then on pollution, climate change, access to fresh water. Uh, I was struck just reading the 
newspaper yesterday about the condition of the aquifers around the world. And, and the, the letter speaks about all of these situations, the, um, the loss of a certain biodiversity, the, the manifest presence of the desertification of significant regions of the world. It begins, it begins with facts, things that we're all reading about or hearing about or learning about when we turn to, to media. In this opening chapter, he points out there's a decline then in the quality of human life and the breakdown of society. For example, he says this is associated with the disproportionate and unruly growth of many cities, which have become, become unhealthy to live in, not only because of pollution caused by toxic emissions, but simply as the result of urban chaos, poor transportation, and what he describes as visual pollution and noise. Well, none of us, none of us can say, what a surprise. I've never encountered any of that. Urban centers are, are challenges to life, but when, as the Pope describes them, as unruly, as when they're out of control, then they become a real challenge to life. While one may decide to prioritize in a different way these range of problems, what our Holy Father is lifting up is a series of facts that beg for some coherent moral analysis, some direction for the good of all on the planet and the good of the planet itself. Thus, our Holy Father finds his starting point as he does so often in his talks, but in this encyclical particularly. The starting point is the dignity of the human person as part of God's plan in all of creation. And Pope Francis highlights that human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships. A relationship with God, a relationship with our neighbor, and then a relationship with the earth itself. It seemed like such a logical starting place for our reflection, for his reflection that he calls us to be a part of. We're called to cooperate with God's design in our relationship with one another and with the world. This, this human ecology, an authentic <coughs> human ecology, brings a worldview to this environmental discussion which helps us to see more clearly the moral lesson woven into all of creation. Men and women are called to live in peace with God, in peace with one another, and in harmony with the natural world. And there should be an increasingly clear harmony between efforts on behalf of the environment and those who, who want to propose an integral, and this includes economic human development. There is a human ecology that's part of the focus of this encyclical. As, as our Holy Father speaks, he speaks as a pastor, offering moral guidance. He's not offering a set of policy proposals. He's touching on the themes of human ecology, care for creation, climate change, a throwaway culture, the call to build a society of solidarity and encounter. And he voices a concern that we're losing, we're losing something of that attitude of wonder, contemplation, of just our ability to listen to creation as poets do, as writers who, who catch the core of the mystery of life are able to do. The encyclical provides us an opportunity to examine how we live, to see what we can do to, to live in a better relationship with God and with the natural world around us. And I think this is something he underlines over and over 
again. A harmony. There has to be a harmony among human beings that also includes a harmony with the world, with creation around us. Three principles stand out in, uh, uh, as in my mind, as deserving special attention. As the letter examines the church's role in economic, scientific, cultural, and political arenas. The first principle is the dignity of the human person. And we will continue to speak to that. That's the frame of reference that we bring to all of these areas of debate, discussion, all of these areas of concern and interest. The dignity of the human person whose inherent worth and immortal destiny is the very rationale for environmental action. But the second is the emphasis on the moral imperative, moral imperative to protect the natural order the world in which we live. And the third, the third is the recognition that in protecting the environment, that does not need to mean that there is not a legitimate economic progress that's a part of the world and the community and human development. Uh, I think of what years ago Pope Paul VI once said, if you want peace, work for justice. But that developed in later papal language and the writings of John Paul II. If you want justice, then work for social development. But today we're hearing if you want social development, you must also work for economic development. And what Francis is saying is that continuum includes then an economic development that is respectful of people and the earth, of the environment in which we live, and the rest of the human family. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis is gently, and, and he does this gently, calls us to consider these moral principles prayerfully, thoughtfully, humbly, and to do it together, to do this as a part of our human communication He's challenging us to rethink how we treat the resources that God has entrusted to us. And uh, he uses some very simple examples. One as simple as not wasting so much food. I don't know if any of you ever have to go to these many dinners, banquets, galas, events, and you think of how much food at the end of the evening is simply wasted. And the Pope is just saying, maybe we could waste just a little bit less. And maybe, maybe when we get into that mindset, we'll be more aware of those who have so much less. Rather than feeling overwhelmed by the enormity of some of these great ecological challenges, Pope Francis is saying, take small steps, all of us. We can take small steps, each of us, to see that our children and grandchildren enjoy clean air, water. In little ways, we can leave the world a better place than we found it. Thus, we can claim, and certainly as, as a priest, as someone who has a responsibility to, to present, to teach the understanding of scripture and the understanding of the church's long magisterium on creation, we can claim that as we respect and care for creation, as well as for one another, we're doing something that our Lord, that Christ asked us to do. And that is work together in a way that we actually begin to manifest the fullness of this world and the beginning of God's kingdom. I think the Pope is simply bringing the voice of that ancient spiritual tradition, that voice of hope and engagement to the problems of our age. He's reading the signs of the times and is simply asking you and me, join in that conversation and when someone says, and what do we bring? 
everyone brings multiple visions, but the church brings a moral understanding of the harmony that should engage all of us, individuals, creation, and our effort to work together to pass on a better world. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Your Eminence, and uh, <coughs> I will uh, ask um, Archbishop Kurtz and perhaps both of you to head back to the podium, uh, and I would just ask those of you here in the audience to uh, address your question to one, either, or both, and so I, my mic is, doesn't seem to be working, so I'm doing the best I can. Um, but, um, so I'll just ask you to raise your hand, and uh, we'll begin some questions. Gentleman in the back is first. Please identify yourself. Uh, I'm Mark Silk with uh, Religion and Service. Um, the Pope does make some pretty explicit calls, including for a drastic, is his word, and uh, within a few years, a reduction of carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases. Uh, there will be those who say that on prudential grounds, uh, that's a matter of view. Uh, do you uh, have anything to say in response to uh, people who would make such uh, objections to uh, such a call? Well, I think every time the church attempts, a pope attempts to speak to the current issues, he's, he's making what we would all call a prudential judgment I mean, the, the great moral norm, do good, avoid evil, has to be applied to every situation in which we live. And so what the Holy Father is doing is saying, look at these facts, and now let us, let us address these facts in light of the moral principle that should be guiding us. I, I don't think that because there's a tentative element to the analysis of a scientific fact, that it's any less imperative. You know, when, uh, when a child reaches, when a person reaches at the grill to see whether it's hot enough, you say, don't touch that or you'll get burned. Mm -hmm. The person can reply, is that a definitive faith judgment or a prudential judgment? Uh, I'm not gonna answer that, but touch the grill and you'll get burned. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the Holy Father is basically saying. We need, with whatever scientific data is available to us to make a moral judgment now. I might add, if I may, uh, just briefly, that uh, I think our Holy Father is clearly saying, uh, I'm not coming to you as a scientist or as a politician, but as uh, a voice of faith. But he is calling for a dialogue that is a dialogue that will bring about results that is not weak. And in fact, if you, if you read the whole document, you know he's not afraid to go back and, and critique these summits that have, have come forward on an international level over the last uh, dozen or two dozen years. And so while I don't think he's presenting uh, a blueprint to say this is exactly the step-by-step -step recipe, uh, he is providing a, a framework and also a true moral call, I think as a, as a moral leader, a, a, a moral call to say, take seriously uh, the urgency of this matter. Tom, I, I would say, first of all, <clears throat> you're right that, that Pope Francis is joining himself with his two, two or three predecessors. You're absolutely right. Uh, he does speak with a unique voice, though, from South America. There's no question about that. And in doing so, <clears throat> I think he's very careful to say, and he's done this consistently, listen, every one of us has responsibility. So he, he won't f fall into either trap, the trap of saying, well, no, this is simply a matter for these particular owners of corporations, nor will he say that they are absolved from it. I think uh, when he talks about the fact that economic 
judgments and decisions need to have moral content. And he, it's throughout the whole document. He's speaking to all of us now. What does it mean? It's marching orders for advocacy, and, and it's things that I know the bishops, uh, USCCB, and others have done for, for many years, but uh, it really brings about a new urgency for us. And uh, Tom, perhaps what is so unique about this, or at least uh, something that should be highlighted, is the Holy Father is asking for a critique from inside. He's asking for a critique by all of those who are the agents of economic development, social development, so that this is not something being presented as, here's how you should do what you need to do, but here are some principles that you ought to be reflecting on as you go about determining how you're going to move into the future. Uh, I think what he has brought is the understanding you need to weigh not just what are the things you're able to do, but what are the things you ought to do within the framework of what you're able to do? Uh, on the end there. You want to go first? <laughs> sure. And I think when you read the letter, you'll find there are no directives being given to people, politicians, people in the economic uh, world, people uh, in, the, in the world of finance. It's an invitation mm -hmm. to take a look at the situation. That's why I think the encyclical does us a great service by beginning with the problems that we can all recognize. And then the Pope says, let's all of us take a look at this together. And I'll bet, I'll bet if we do, and applying these moral principles of the dignity of the person, the importance of the environment, and also uh, the, the right order of social development and economic development, I'll bet we'll find answers. I might add, if, if I may, that obviously I, I don't know exact quotes, and I, I know you don't want me to take positions on political candidates for the coming election. Uh, however, uh, I, I will say this, that I think in, in a general structural way, we know that politics and economics have moral content. We know that. And we know that, uh, that faith and people of goodwill uh, enrich public life. So we're, we, we, we don't see this as an added burden. We see this as part, a central part of the solution if we look for the common good. And politics has as its base the common good serving all. And so uh, I, I hope that, that the encyclical, you know, wh whenever there's a, a, a public event, a public uh, item coming into the news, uh, there are short discussions of it, even before it's read and even after it's read quickly. So I think we need to give ourselves time, all of us, in including the bishops, to uh, be able to reflect and read and study. But I must say that I think those who, who take it seriously to study, as, as uh, His Eminence said, I think we'll find that there really is an invitation. It's an invitation to dialogue, but not a weak invitation. It's a, it's a, an, there's an urgency in calling for that uh, dialogue. Some questions are being submitted electronically. Did you want to add something? I, well, I was just, if I can build, just build on something the Archbishop said, you know, the church is in this for the long, long haul. We're a 2,000-year-old institution, and we have all learned that it takes a long, long time to get the message out. Sound bites uh, are an immediate response, mm -hmm. and there's always the, the temptation uh, to read quickly a document and get something out of it. And the church is saying, we're probably gonna be studying this a long time. 
and trying to engage people in the discussion for a long, long time. Maybe if we ask ourselves a year from now, what came out of that? We might get different responses. We are in favor of sound bites here at the National Press Club. <laughs> <laughs> and we're also in favor of messages submitted electronically. And this is one that helps journalists who, as you just referenced, anticipate something. And that is uh, the Pope's visit uh, to the U.S. and Washington in September. So the question is, should he discuss climate change when he visits Washington in September? How might he do it? And we know the President has said he looks forward to discussing that with him as well. Do you want to say that? Well, let me begin by saying how much we are looking forward to the visit of Pope Francis here to Washington. Uh, and we have been preparing and preparing, and we are just very excited, as is, I believe, the city, uh, with the arrival of Pope Francis. What he will say, uh, I have no way of knowing. But I suspect that he will speak. He's coming here on a pastoral visit. He will speak out of the heart of a pastor. And he will be addressing the, the issues that we're all so very much concerned about. And that is the, the issues of uh, the, the dignity of the person, the development of the human person, our need to be in harmony with one another, our solidarity. I think those may be some of the topics. Whether he gets into specific issues, I think we'll just have to wait and see. Just to set the record straight, too, I must say I'm, I'm a fan of the world of 140 bytes. Uh, so uh, Twitter uh, is, is a great, great gift. Uh, it is a gift, though, that leads us to further reflection, I think. That's what we're saying. Dennis, thank you. Uh, let me say a few words initially. First of all, remember, uh, we're dealing with a train that's already running, and that's a good thing. Uh, I went to our website for USCCB uh, yesterday, and I, and I noticed that when I looked at the statements and letters and interventions in Congress that have been made over the last few years, it was three pages. They weren't the interventions. They were just the... the, the the, the listing of the various areas. So from the viewpoint of advocacy, I, I think this is uh, actually increasing an energy that's already present. Uh, I was uh, really uh, found it helpful to see that it was 1990 that St. John Paul II had his World Day of Peace message. Guess what it was on? Care of God's creation. So we're dealing with a progression, and in fact, the first statement of the U.S. bishops was that next year, 1991, on this very topic. Uh, you're right that that the effort, what I said earlier in remi my remarks, uh, in advocacy, there's great efforts, and uh, and there's also great efforts in formation. I'm I'm impressed within the Archdiocese of Louisville by the number of people in our Catholic schools and in our programs of religious instruction who have a really a healthy regard and understanding for some of the very principles, the, the voiceless and the vulnerable, the care of every human person, care of our environment, Earth Day. I mean, these are things that I think are being well grounded. I think our Holy Father is giving us now a framework for young people to understand it. Uh, we have people going on mission trips. I remember in 2000, I don't know if you were on that trip in 2008 with, with Catholic Relief Services to Ethiopia, where we saw very specifically the contrast between parts of Ethiopia that did not have clean water. And not only the malnutrition, but the disease that was present. And then when, when, when um, wells were dug and, and water was made accessible, the effect that had in, in the whole social life of people and, of course, the environment. Our young people are seeing, I think, many of these areas. So uh, you're right that when, when all is said and done, there will be a great task to be able to present and to do so in a, in a form of dialogue that engages people. But it, the, the train is running in, in, in the right direction. We have a lot of good things that have been in place. Another question uh, via text from Michelle, who tells me she's in the back, uh, but representing the Washington Post. 
what specifically will you tell priests and school directors about how to implement this, and what are specific moral implications for your diocese and for Catholics? Michelle, thank you. I see you back there. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I want to begin by uh, saying, since this is uh, in defense of sound bites, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the gospel today, the gospel for Mass today, was the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. Talk about sound bites, but it only makes full sense in the context of the whole gospel. And so in answer to the question, what will we be asking our, our priests, what will we be asking our parishioners to engage in? It will be in, a, first of all, a reading of the text. Uh, and we will already provide for them some outlines, reading guides, study guides. Uh, the text, and I hope what is happening today will be an initial presentation of it but we won't be able to say everything in the time allotted us here today. But the next step is the reading of the text, the studying of the text, and the engagement of people in what the Holy Father calls us to do, apply it to ourselves. You know, the great decisions that will be made on the level of world leaders and international gatherings are one thing. But every one of us, the encyclical says, can do our part in building a better world and in building this relationship among ourselves, which would be much richer and fuller as we move forward. So in answer to the question, what will we be doing? The first thing we want to do is help people, our people, understand and our priests to say, this is going to take a lot of unpacking. There's a great amount of richness in this document. Let's do that. Let's do that over a period of time. And maybe at the end of a year, we'll be able to reflect, what did the document say? But now we'll be able to answer it in terms of what effect did it have on all of us in trying to live it. Okay. I'd like to just add one other thing to what uh, His Eminence said, and that is, uh, really thanks to the media. We have live streaming of this gathering. And uh, through USCCB, there's the live streaming. And in fact, uh, I know in the Archdiocese of Louisville, all of our priests and parish leaders were given an email last night saying, please tune in. And so that level of engagement is, thanks to all the progress that has been made today, uh, an involvement in people beyond this room are sharing in what we're doing today. And that in itself, we could not have said uh, a dozen years ago. Hi, uh, Doug Obey with Inside ETA. Uh, with the apologies in advance, I know you're talking about this in a long-term sense, but there are some short-term political debates and regulatory debates happening in Washington, D.C., including on ETA's Clean Power Plan. What are the implications of the uh, encyclical for that debate? And to be blunt about it, to be a good Catholic, do you have to support the ETA Clean Power Plan? I think that brings us back to the question of what, what should be the result of this encyclical? And as I read it, what the Holy Father is saying is engagement, mm -hmm. discussion. And what he's offering is a moral framework within which that discussion will take place. But every, every entity engaged in the question of environment is going to bring its own set of data, its own set of facts, its own experience. And so the moral frame of reference is what the Pope is offering, but he's not saying this is the conclusion of, of that discussion. And I think that's all part of this process. Uh, as Archbishop Kurtz said, you, know, you have helped initiate this, the very fact that you are all here and that these cameras and uh, and laptops are all busily at work, and that this is streaming, is the beginning of that conversation, which is going to be not just a national conversation, but a worldwide conversation. I think we can say, as I said earlier, make no mistake about it, our, our Bishop's Conference has taken very specific positions. And in that process, when we look at 
of the positions that have been taken and the way in which not only they're communicated, but that there's a background to understand them. That is a, a process of education that, that we need to go on with. And we see even uh, greater involvement between the United States Conference of Bishops and local state conferences precisely to build uh, that communication. Speaking of conversations, here's a question from the 716 area code. Uh, will both or either of you be briefing members of Congress and or the White House on the encyclical? And if so, uh, they'd like to know uh, who you might be speaking with. Yeah. Uh, Steve was good enough to give me an answer. Uh, uh, in, in essence, our, our, our uh, staff for the USCCB on a regular basis is on the Hill. And we will be uh, providing in written form uh, in a special way, but also there's ongoing dialogue that occurs yes, with leaders. We have two briefings today and one tomorrow. So what time are the briefings? Uh, we have uh, briefings in the Senate and House uh, today uh, at 10.30 and at 2.30, and then we have a White House briefing tomorrow. Thank you. In the back there. John Carr from America Magazine. Uh, the Pope is like here for creation and action on climate change in the middle of a Christian effort. He is also placed here for the weak and vulnerable, including the unborn, for example, in the middle of an environmental effort. That's enough to make everyone in Washington uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> how would you, in this engagement, get people out of their boxes, the, their political parties, their ideologies, their economic status? The, how do you challenge Democrats and Republicans, environmentalists and business, liberals and conservatives, to move beyond where they are instead of just looking at the encyclical to reaffirm what they already believe? John, thanks. Let me just say an initial word. And one is, uh, one of the calls that I think our Holy Father is saying is, like it or not, for the good of, of our earth and one another, we need to move beyond self-interest. And so often, let's face it, uh, we live in an environment which is often driven by self-interest and sometimes extremely narrow self-interest. This call is, as I said earlier, a dialogue that is meant to have some meat on the bone. In other words, it's, it's meant to be a challenging dialogue. And uh, uh, as always, whenever we go up to the Hill or when we're in conversations, we're always looking for bipartisan solutions. We're always looking to bring people together in one. But I think the church, in that sense, is not the only moral voice, but has a, a, a very positive moral voice in being able to bring that call to bring out the best in people. And I think his, his sense of what is it we want to leave to future generations is a call that touches not just the head but also the heart. And I think you've touched, John, on something that is really the long-term, long-range focus of this encyclical. This is not an easy answer. This is not a quick fix document. It's a document that's calling all of us to bring our experience, our knowledge, our wisdom to a debate, a discussion, a reflection. But the Holy Father is offering us now a moral parameter within which we can have that discussion. But I think it's very clear in the document that this is going to have to take place over time. Uh, today, this is a wonderful start, but I don't think anyone would envision that we will leave this room now with answers for every problem and every issue. But we will have begun this fruitful conversation that over time, uh, I think each one of us receives a document like this from our own perspective. And we need to hear that perspective of others and then begin to move forward. I think your question is really at the heart of it. Can we, over time, use this encyclical to help enrich all of us as we try to find some common ground? Another question uh, submitted electronically, uh, and I think it might be to um, uh, the Cardinal. Do you personally plan on addressing this in a homily either this weekend or any time in the near term? and how many priests uh, in the area uh, might be doing the same? Well, the first question I can answer, the second question would be more 
a hopeful prayer. Uh, but already uh, there, were, there is posted a blog uh, on our Archdiocesan uh, blog. We'll have a, another one tomorrow and another one following that. Uh, the, this is the beginning of the opening of discussion. Uh, I have already asked the priest when the encyclical is public, and that means today. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had the final copy. Uh, when it's public, we will be providing talking points, we'll be providing, and our Conference of Bishops has provided us really good material uh, to get that out so that they can engage in discussion. Uh, but we're starting at right now with getting that word out electronically, and I hope, uh, I hope we're doing a good, uh, a good job because I see some of my own staff here uh, getting these out in Twitter form, getting these out in soundbite form, but getting them out also uh, with talking points and then the whole text. We are in Washington when we're discussing Twitter talking points and soundbites, right? <laughs> uh, are there any further questions from the audience before we prepare to wrap up? Yes. Hi, sorry, from down here, Kathy sure. Grossman from the Living Room Service. Sure. Um, the Pope has presented this encyclical as a quest, as a, in the context of moral justice, social mm -hmm. justice, and concern for the poor. So it takes on a whole other level beyond the nitty gritty of power plants and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, po when politicians such as Jeb Bush step out and say, well, I'm not listening to the church on this matter. Uh, does this remind you of Kennedy's speech before the Baptist bishop in the ba not bishop, Baptist leadership in nineteen in the nineteen sixties, um, saying, "Well, yes, I'm a Catholic, but no, I'm not listening to the church." And are they being actually um, cafeteria Catholics or conservatives because they're very quick to stand with the church when they agree on issues about the family and sexuality, but they don't want to listen. I think you're raising a very, very important distinction. Our Holy Father is speaking, and he's speaking out of our Catholic tradition. But if you read the document carefully, he is not saying to individuals, whether they are in the economic area or the political area uh, or the area of finance, you must do this. That doesn't appear in the document. He is saying, here is the frame of reference, the moral frame of reference. I would like everyone to work together on this so that we individually would come to the conclusion, this is what we should do. But he's not saying, you must do this. I think it's a very good approach to say, I'll teach as pope, and you, I invite into a conversation about this, but I'm not telling you what the conclusion must be. So I've been asked to mention that uh, there are several experts, uh, not that uh, we don't have two at the podium already. <laughs> Additional <laughs> experts uh, supplied essentially uh, you, by Jim. the this conference who are yeah, free to discuss help. with you uh, these subjects in further detail. They're Daniel, and par I pardon the uh, likely mispronunciation, Misley of the Catholic Climate Covenant, Christiana Pe Peppard, of the Fordham University and Dr. Stephen Colecci of the um, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, your Eminence and Your Excellency, thank you very much for being here this morning. It's uh, important to have subjects of such import uh, discussed at the National Press Club and important people like you to discuss it. We thank you very much for being here. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck to you.